Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Alrighty, welcome everybody to our second press conference of Tuesday, January 11th at 2.15 Mountain Time, which is what time it would be if we were all in Salt Lake, uh, or 4.15 Eastern Time. And the conference is called Cellar Nurseries, Clusters, and Streams. Uh, so I am Haley Wall. I am the AAS Media Fellow and a grad student at West Virginia University, and I'm going to be emceeing today. Assisting me, we have Carrie Hensley, who is the Deputy Press Officer, who will be helping with Q&A, and Susanna Kohler, who is the AAS Press Officer. So they'll be helping with Q&A and any technical issues that come up. So today we will have, there are five total press releases associated with three of the briefings. Two of those five have already been released. The videos from yesterday's press release and the press kit have all been uploaded to the AAS website and the presentations have been as well. So a couple of ground rules here. We are recording this briefing and also live streaming it to YouTube. For this briefing, I'll give a brief introdu introduction of the topic and introduce the panelists and their presentations. And then all panelists will speak in order back to back and then we'll go live to Q&A. So all attendees, please put your questions in the Q&A feature that we have on Zoom. Please don't put, please, um, just put them in the Q&A and we'll take care of those. We will take care of them all after. And when you do have your affiliate in, when you do put a question in the chat, please put your affiliation and your name so that we can uh, represent you properly. And you can upvote the other's questions if you think they are good questions. And note that all presenters are going to answer questions live. They're not going to answer them in the Q&A, just because we're streaming this to YouTube and people on the YouTube cannot see that Q&A. So we have four presenters today. The first one will be Zhao Chen from UCLA with their presentation titled, A New Window on Star Formation History at the Galactic Center. Next one is Xiao Zhang with Giant Molecular Clouds, Storytellers of the Galactic Center's history in the past few hundred years. And Zhao Chen is from Bard College. And then next up, we'll have Allison Hughes from the University of Arizona with her presentation titled, Identifying Hidden Globular Clusters in the Centaurus A Galaxy. And then last, we'll have Ting Li from the University of Toronto with a presentation titled, 12 for Dinner, The Milky Way's Feeding Habits Shine a Light on Dark Matter. So we are going to get started. Sure, thank you. Let me share my screen. I think the title slide is okay. Uh, cool, let me get started. Um, my name is Zhuo Chen from University of California, Los Angeles. Today, I want to share some new results of the star formation history of the Milky Way galaxy. Here, we report two groups of stars at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. 90% of the stars are in group one, 4 billion years old, and 10% of stars are in group two, with age between 1 to 4 billion years. This is the very first time the metal abundances of stars are used to determine the star formation history in, in the galactic center. We found that the center of our galaxy may be surprisingly younger than people expected. This is about half the age as previously thought. Here we say younger means that they were born and formed later than the older ones. In comparison, we think many of the stars in the inner bulge region is around 10 billion years old. Our reported young age is challenging to explain for current formation and evolution scenarios. And the results can also help us make more accurate predictions of the number of compact objects, including white dwarfs, neutron stars, and stellar mass black holes. The nuclear star cluster at the center is most the most massive and densest star cluster in the Milky Way with a mass of 20 million solar masses and also contains a 4 million solar mass supermassive black hole. 
some of the big questions here are, how did all the stars get there? And how do the stars interact with the supermassive black hole? The big telescopes on the ground allow us to resolve the individual stars in this extremely dense region and understand the complete picture. In this work, we use the observations from Gemini, VLT, and Keck to probe these exciting science questions. The current limitation in the star formation history is missing the ingredient of metal abundances of stars. Metal abundance is the amount of elements heavier than helium compared to the sun. And why do we care about the metal abundances? Because the age and metal contents of the star are degenerate properties in the star formation history. By ignoring the effect of metal abundances, the age estimates can be biased. So in this work, for the first time, we use the measurements of metal abundances of stars when determining the star formation history. Here, we report two groups of stars. 92% of the stars are in the dominant older group with age around 4 billion years old. They are metal rich with metal abundances three times higher than the sun. And around 8% of stars are in the minor younger group with age between one to 4 billion years. They are metal pool with metal abundances only one tenth of solar. And then focusing on the dominant older group, this age of 4 billion years old is actually younger than any previously reported age for this population. And if we assume stars have solar metal abundances as done by previous works, we found the age of this dominant group is around 7.1 billion years. But thanks to the more recent measurements, we know this assumption is not accurate anymore. So here we report that new, the nuclear star cluster is almost half as old if metal abundances are included. In the latest star formation history study shown on the left with brightness versus temperature, you can see a group of low temperature faint stars could never be well constrained by any star formation events with their assumption of solar metal abundances. And now in this work on the right, by including the measurements of metal abundances of stars, we're able to, for the first time, account for this low temperature thin stars. The observed data sets shown as the red crosses now is well characterized by the modeled two groups of stars shown in the density map on the back, with the dominant metal rich group and the minor metal pool group. And this plot shows the predicted number of compact remnants in this work show in red compared to the predictions if using previously reported metal abundances show in blue. And in particular, our predicted number of neutron stars decreases by a factor of three. Our predictions introduce a new path to the so-called missing pulsar problem at the galactic center, where the community has surveyed for decades without detecting a population of pulsars as expected. And this work shows that the number of pulsars we expect might depend on the metal abundances of stars. And this could be part of the explanation of this question. And moreover, our predictions also provide essential inputs to the models for predicting the number of gravitational wave mergers in the centers of the galaxies. This work is crucial to our understanding of the complete picture of how the center of Milky Way galaxy formed. The galactic center has some of the highest metal stars in the universe. And taking this into account has decreased our estimate of the age of stars. And such younger age may challenge the mutual evolutionary theory of the nuclear star cluster, the central supermassive black hole, and the inner bulge. This young age may also challenge the infalling scenario from globular clusters because of the insufficient accumulation time. 
In addition, now we can also make more accurate predictions of the number of compact objects and the rate of gravitational wave mergers. In the near future, we will be able to obtain more observations of much fainter stars uh, with James Webb. And then we also want to point out the biggest uncertainty right now is the accuracy of the model, models at high metal abundances. Because these stars have unusually high metal contents compared to other places. So calibrating such models for the metal rich stars will give us more accurate measurements. To summarize, we report the first star formation history at the center of the Milky Way galaxy with the measurements of stellar metal abundances. The nuclear star cluster now is younger than people expected, which may challenge the current formation and evolution scenarios. We also predict three times fewer neutron stars with the additional metal abundances constraints. And uh, thanks for listening. Let's move on to the next speaker. Okay, so let me share my screens. All right, so uh, my talk today will focus on another type of object in the galactic center uh, that are giant molecular clouds which serve as storytellers of the galactic center's uh, activity history in the past a few hundred years. So before I start, I want to highlight contributions from two student researchers, Natalie Jones, a postdoc researcher at Bar College and Field Rogers, a graduate student at MIT. Okay, so if zooming into the central few hundred parsecs of our galaxy, you will notice a very interesting structure. So this 100 parsec elliptical and twisted ring of cold and dense molecular gas. Uh, this region is also called the central molecular zone, which contains five to 10% of all the cold gas in the entire galaxy. A notable phenomena from this molecular gas cloud is that some of them demonstrate bright and variable X-ray emission, including a 6.4 keV iron KR for line as well as a, a continuum emission up to about 100 keV. So we know that the cold molecular gas themselves cannot emit X-ray emissions. They must, um, one possible scenario is that they are reflecting incoming X-ray emission from some, some powerful and energetic source. And the likely such powerful and energetic source is believed to be the central supermassive black hole, Sagittarius star, when it was more active in the past. Now, therefore, here's how we can play, uh, play this um, astro uh, archaeology game by mirroring and studying the X-ray emission from the molecular clouds in the central molecular zone. We can reconstruct the activity history of the central supermassive black hole, such as star. As uh, discussed before, because we see the uh, iron fluorescence line from these clouds, as well as the uh, continuum em emission due to Compton scattering. Therefore, some groups, including our own, developed analytical methods to calculate required past the Sagittarius star luminosity based on some observable parameters, such as the X-ray intensity or the luminous, luminosity level of a particular molecular cloud and the distance from a particular cloud, molecular cloud to Sagittarius star. So if we measure the X-ray emission level and we know the distance uh, is distance to Sagittarius star, then we can calculate uh, the required luminosity of, of Sagittarius star at a particular epoch in the past. For example, if we study the X-ray emission of molecular clouds in the central molecular zone, then based on the roughly, roughly known distance to Sagittarius star, we can infer the Sagittarius star's activity in the past a couple of hundred years, roughly uh, from maybe 100 to 500 years ago. So we know that nowadays such a star is in a very inactive stage and its X-ray luminosity is in the order of 10 to 33 arcs per second as shown in the upper left image. However, these molecular clouds in the central molecular zone, their X-ray emission tell us that such a star used to be much brighter um, 
a, a couple of hundred years ago with an X-ray luminosity reaching 10 to 39 Earths per second. That is six orders of magnitude, magnitude higher than its current quiescent uh, X-ray emission level. If you think other um, uh, phenomena are also associated with such a star, including molecular clouds farther away, as well as Fermi bubbles, then you can, you can like see this trend. It seems to suggest that such a star has been, its activity has been decreasing consistently in the past a million years ago and all the way to its current quiescent stage. Now, especially from now on, I'm going to focus on two of the most interesting molecular clouds in the central molecular zone, SAGE B2 and the bridge cloud, now which again can tell us what SAGE star was doing a couple of hundred years ago. So let's first look at the SAGE B2 molecular cloud. It's located at about 100 parsec from SAGE star in the projected distance, and its a line of sight distance is uh, more, uh, more uncertain, but it's roughly 130 parsec in front of a such a star, some, somehow closer to us. Now, if you look at the light curve, the X-ray light curve of such V2 uh, obtained in the past two decades, and that's the image in the upper right. So we can see that its X-ray emission has been consistently decreasing ever since early 2000 and reaching to um, a very low level in the year of 2018, which is about roughly um, one order of magnitude lower than its uh, peak uh, luminosity. Now, using the methods uh, we just uh, discussed, now we using uh, we can measure the peak luminosity of such V2, and we can calculate now what was such a star's outburst uh, luminosity level, and that is about 10 to 38 to 10 to 39 Earths per second, and that major X-ray outburst. Uh, happens roughly roughly 110 years ago. The lower panel uh, is more, more straightforwardly shows the fainting trend of such V2, especially in the core, in its core region. And that's images, uh, X-ray images obtained by Exxon Newton of such V2 from 2002 to 2018. As you can see that the central region has been dimming down. But the story is more complicated than that. Although the core region has been consistently dimming down, but if you look at some substructures now within the, um, the entire giant uh, molecular cloud, if you ignore the telephone number name of these subclumps, now we just call them clump A, B, and C here, now within the diffuse region in the uh, molecular gas cloud, and you can uh, look at the uh, black dots and the lines, now which shows the X-ray light curve of these three um, subclumps. And you can see that they have different behaviors. Uh, they have very um, different time variabilities. And um, some of them are actually um, in, have, a, have an increasing like uh, luminosity level, very different from the core region. So what he tell us is that, so firstly, the substructure of the giant molecular clouds are very complicated and very clumpy. And also we cannot rule out that such B2 have been illuminated by more than one extra outburst. So it could involve um, a second illumination event. So this work was uh, very recently submitted to uh, APJ. Now let's look at another um, molecular cloud, the so-called bridge. It's, it is located um, at 18 parsec in the projected distance from such a star. And it has a very different um, time variability compared to set B2. So here I'm showing you three uh, X-ray images ob obtained by different uh, X-ray telescopes in different epochs. And the left one is obtained by XMM Newton that's accumulated um, like a mosaic image from 2000, 2009. And you can see the braid molecular cloud. It does not really stand out. It's just among um, several of very bright um, X-ray bright um, molecular clouds in the SAGE complex region or the central molecular zone region. It's even less bright than uh, some uh, nearby molecular clouds. But if you look at more recent years, for example, I recently uh, released the EuroCETA data in 2019 and our most recent uh, new star data obtained in 2020, we noticed that the bridge cloud uh, is standing out uh, significantly, and it becomes the brightest and most dominating um, diffuse X-ray feature in the such a complex region. So we're wondering what it has it has been doing 
in the recent years. Therefore, my uh, poster back, Natalie Jones, and I um, digged out all the archival X-ray mission obtained by New Star Telescope and XMEM Telescope, uh, as well as our own uh, newest results. And we see this very clear trend um, that is um, like consistently obtained uh, from both uh, telescopes, that the X-ray emission level for the bridge molecular cloud has been monotonically increasing in the past two decades, from uh, about 2000 all the way to 2020. Also, both New Star and XMEM results tell us that it seems um, the increasing trend uh, has been slowing down since 2016. Seem, uh, that suggests that it could uh, be approaching the peak X-ray luminosity. So now we know that the bridge has an increasing trend in the past two decades. Well, such B2 has a decreasing emission trend in the past 20 years. So what um, do these um, phenomena tell us? So here, let me provide one possible scenario. Well, such B2 molecular cloud, this um, a green, light green circle here, located at about 100 parsec um, in projected distance from such a star. So this is a top-down view of the galactic center. The horizontal line is the projected plane or the galactic plane. And the vertical line represents the line of sight. And we, uh, the observers, are in the bottom. Okay, so such B2 molecular cloud is located closer to us in front of the um, in front of such a star. Well, the bridge molecular cloud is most likely located behind the galactic plane, like further away from us compared to such a star. Now, if we trust uh, this like uh, loca uh, location information reported in earlier literature and use the methods we discussed before, what they tell us is that now the SAGE V2 located at about 160 parsec from such a star requires a SAGE star major outburst with an X-ray luminosity in the order of 10 to 39 ergs per second. Now, again, that's six orders of magnitude higher than its current activity. And that should happen about 100 years ago. On the other hand, the bridge molecular cloud located farther away from us, uh, from, uh, from us compared to such a star and located at about 60 parsec from such a star. And its X-ray emission requires an X-ray outburst with uh, a slightly lower, but a uh, comparable X-ray luminosity in the order of 10 to 39 ergs per second, but that should happen uh, long, uh, uh, like a long, longer time ago, about like 400 years ago. But um, I want to note that the line of sight distance for these molecular clouds uh, have very high uncertainty. Uh, if in the near future we can uh, better constrain the line of sight distance of these molecular clouds, then we can draw an even firmer um, conclusion on um, what scientists are was doing in the past a couple of hundred years. Now, lastly, uh, let me uh, summarize our findings here. Uh, we are seeing a uh, 20 years of uh, X-ray decay for such V2, ever since early 2000. On the contrary, the bridge molecular cloud sees a 20 year long X-ray brightening. For such V2, the decay is because the light front of a past such outburst has swept through and left the cloud, so leaving the cloud uh, dimming down um, with time. But for the bridge cloud, the its X-ray emission is uh, increasing. That is because the light front of a past outburst is currently sweeping through the cloud, making it brighter and brighter. But um, hopefully it will soon, in the next few years, reach its peak luminosity, and that can more ac accurately constrain the luminosity level of um, this uh, illumination events. But what's most impo uh, important is that the ultimate question we want to ask is that, do these molecular clouds really tell us stories of different X-ray outbursts from, star, uh, from such a star happened at a different epochs? Um, and uh, even more importantly, why? Uh, what sort of uh, events cause such major outbursts of our own supermassive black hole? Is it due to some transient phenomena like capture and disruption of some, some objects or could it be due to other mechanisms? So that's the remaining ask, uh, uh, question we are pursuing. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention.
Uh, hello, I think I'm going next and starting. There we go. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Hughes. I'm a graduate student at the University of Arizona uh, and I'm working to find globular clusters hidden in the outer halo of Centaurus A using a combination, ooh, using a combination of space and ground-based telescopes. Uh, and so Centaurus A, or Sene, uh, because that's easier to say, uh, is the fifth brightest galaxy in the sky, although it can only be seen from the Southern hemisphere. It's an elliptical galaxy, and it has evidence of major mergers in its recent past, uh, which leads to its peculiar structure. Uh, and Sene is relatively close to us, uh, and is one of the major members of its own group of galaxies, and as such, it does provide a unique comparison with the local group. Uh, so the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies are barred spirals that are about two to three times lower in mass and in a less dense environment than Sene is. Uh, but unfortunately, Sene's location on the sky puts it close to the galactic plane, uh, which leads to some significant contamination from Milky Way foreground stars uh, in all of our observations that we do have to remove. Uh, Sene is also far enough away that we can't see its individual stars, but we can see its globular clusters. These are old, dense groups of thousands of stars that all formed at roughly the same time, and globular clusters are found in nearly all galaxies. Globular clusters are cool um, because they can tell us a lot about uh, uh, these large galaxies. Uh, so this is a map of the Andromeda galaxy with its globular clusters color-coded by their relative velocities. Uh, we're working on a map like this for Sen A. Uh, and if you see a line of globular clusters that all have similar velocities and similar metallicities, like the ones that have kind of been outlined in the colored shapes, uh, they must have come from the same smaller galaxy that collided with the larger parent galaxy. And while the original structure of the infalling smaller galaxy is lost, as its stars and gas are absorbed into the larger parent galaxy, because globular clusters are so densely packed, they're able to withstand these giant tidal pressures and remain intact, uh, which allows globular clusters to be used to trace the formation history of larger galaxies. And then globular clusters at large distances that are unassociated with any substructures can be used to measure a more accurate total mass of the parent galaxy. So here on the left uh, is data from the Panoramic Imaging Survey of Centaurus and Sculptor, or Pisces, uh, it shows large scale galactic structure in the halo of Sene, uh, visible in these over densities of red giant branch stars. Uh, and since the first discovery of globular clusters in Sene in the 1980s, many surveys have been conducted leading to the identification of 557 confirmed globular clusters that are all close to the center of Sene. Uh, but based on my own updated models, we expect there to be close to three times this number of globular clusters in total. So both the presence of wide reaching stellar halo substructures and the large uh, globular cluster population illustrate that there is substantial room for novel studies uh, of the Sene globular cluster population, especially in this outer halo region that's nearly unexplored with spectroscopy. Um, because the data is so good in the Pisces survey, globular clusters at the distance of Sene are marginally resolved. They're a little bit fuzzy, so they can be separated from foreground stars by measuring the amount of light gathered in concentric apertures, kind of like what's shown in the little cartoon on the left. Uh, so I kick out the boring point sources that are most likely Milky Way foreground stars uh, and keep the slightly extended sources as they're more likely to be globular clusters in Sene. And I'm also able to identify things like very distant background galaxies, as well as Milky Way foreground stars that are so close and bright that they oversaturate the telescope's detectors. Uh, next, I use data from the Gaia telescope, uh, which is an ongoing all-sky mission to make a precise three-dimensional map of the Milky Way by surveying more than a billion stars. Uh, and Gaia allows me to identify and remove any Milky Way foreground stars that have statistically significant proper motion or parallax movements, because anything that's in at the distance of Sene would not have any measurable motion in it. Uh, additionally, with its impressive clarity and stellar models, Gaia also includes statistics that can be used to pinpoint interesting sources, 
such as globular clusters in Sene. Uh, and then the third major data set that I use is the NOAO source catalog which is a unified collection of the public data taken with some of the instruments on the Blanco telescope in Chile and the male telescope here in Arizona, uh, reprocessed with consistent quality control, selection, and calibration. Um, and it includes my area of interest around CENA that was uh, done using the Chilean Blanco telescope. Uh, and usefully, the color of globular clusters is different than that of foreground stars and background galaxies. So the data available uh, in this data set, uh, in this catalog provides yet another method to identify and remove contaminants. So there's a whole lot of information from these three very different sources, uh, but I bring it all together from Pisces, from Gaia and the NOAO source catalog uh, to build my own catalog of globular clusters that is ranked based on their likelihood of being true globular clusters in Sene. Uh, and this is the distribution of the most promising globular cluster candidates. And we do see an over density of candidates close to the center of Sene, as is expected. Uh, and right now I'm working to analyze spectroscopic data based on follow-up observations that were done of my uh, candidates to either confirm or deny the association of these globular cluster candidates with Sene. And on the right is a globular cluster spectrum taken with the Anglo-Australian telescope. Uh, I can measure the velocity of a cluster candidate via the Doppler shift of known elemental features uh, where separating <coughs> globular clusters from the foreground stars is fairly straightforward as Sene is moving at about 540 kilometers per second and globular cluster candidates with radial velocities greater than 250 kilometers per second are typically considered to be moving along with Sene and therefore confirmed as true GCs. And this is also our cutoff value. Uh, and we've already confirmed more than a hundred new globular clusters based on this. Newly obtained. Uh, and uh, an interesting note that we found during the course of this project uh, is that the modest systematic velocity and velocity dispersion of Sene, um, there is some overlap between the radial velocity of Sene GCs and fast moving Milky Way foreground stars. So unfortunately, just because something is moving fast doesn't mean it's actually in Sene. Uh, and we found instance of 50 contaminant foreground stars that had significant prop promotion or parallax measurements in the Gaia data set that were previously misidentified as globular clusters. And uh, by, removing, um, by removing these contaminants makes the mean value of the radial velocity of the globular clusters more consistent um, with the galaxy as a whole and also makes the distribution more symmetric about the mean, um, which is what we expect to see based on other galaxies. So as a quick summary, um, so my project connects data from Gaia with ground-based observations to identify and confirm globular clusters out to a projected radius of 150 kiloparsecs. Uh, and these globular clusters can be used to study the large scale properties of galaxies like Sene, including uncovering its formation history. And then hopefully these methods of finding globular clusters can be extended to other nearby galaxies. For example, sculptor M81 or M91, just to name a few. So thanks, and I hope to answer any of your questions. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. So hello everyone. So my name is Ting Li. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto. Today I'm gonna share with you a story uh, titled The 12 for Dinner. The Milky Way's feeding habits shine a light on dark matter. So this is based on the recent paper that is accepted by Astrophysical uh, uh, Journal uh, entitled uh, S5, the orbital and a chemical property of one dozen stellar stream. So I wanna highlight that this work is done without a it can be done without a great group of people that are from the S5 collaboration. And I will mention more later, in case you're interested in our work here, you're welcome to check uh, our website afterwards. So stream is not um, 
unusual or uncommon thing that in the press release, it seems always catched by a lot of journalists. If you Google stream, probably or stellar stream, you might see a lot of these pictures, beautiful pictures. And a, a lot of uh, uh, press release associated with uh, these stellar streams are often uh, from studies for one stream at a time. And here, this time, we present a homogeneous study of one dozen or 12 stellar streams that in our Milky Way. So what you are seeing here is the background is from the, 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 the flux map from Gaia. And on top, we uh, plot the individual star, the stellar members, uh, star members, uh, the member stars that in uh, 12 stellar stream that uh, we identified from our S5 observation. And uh, when we say we studied them, we're not only talking about where they are on the sky, we know the their location in 3D, also their motion in 3D, and also the chemical composition of these stars um, using all the observation we are taking. And uh, with all these great rich data set, uh, we were able to study the feeding habits of the Milky Way to understand how Milky Way um, grow up or say become um, um, fatter and fatter or heavier or heavier over time. And also this is a very useful data set for us to study the distribution of the invisible uh, dark matter in the Milky Way, which I will mention later. But before that, I just want to give a very um, quick overview what uh, we are talking about when we say stellar stream. So uh, you may have known that uh, in the Milky Way, there's a lot of companions. So in this uh, Gaia map, you can see these two bright um, uh, object here. These are the uh, the large and the small Magellan clouds that if you ever had a chance to go to the Southern Hemisphere, this is what you will see actually with a naked eye. So these are the satellite galaxies of our Milky Way. And there are also these kind of small bright dots. I'm not sure if you can see um, on your screen well, but these, if you zoom in, these are these companions of our Milky Way, the star clusters, or sometimes we also call global clusters, that uh, a group of stars that also orbiting around our Milky Way. So when these, um, here is a movie showing, when these global clusters and satellite galaxies, they get close to the Milky Way and they can get pull apart and uh, form these kind of long tidal features, what we call uh, stellar streams. So these are the remnants of the neighboring star galaxies and star clusters that are torn apart by the Milky Way. So here is a simulation run by my collaborator, also one of the members from S5, that's showing that uh, when we put in 10 uh, global cluster in a Milky Way-like potential, let me move here and stop here, and in a Milky Way potential and let it evolve for uh, about 8 billion years and you see how these global clusters get tidally disrupted and form these kind of long structures. So, so far in the Milky Way, we have discovered a total of over, uh, I think, 60 or 70, depending on who you ask, uh, by all the astronomers. And uh, so in 2018, uh, when I see all of these were discovered, a, a lot of exciting stuff. So I feel like, ah, oh, we should actually do some follow up. So I started this uh, survey, S5, uh, stands for Southern Stellar Stream Spectroscope Survey. It utilized the telescope in Australia, uh, the 3.9 meter angular Australian telescope. And the unique feature of it is it has a very large field of view. So it can observe a big area of the sky at a time. It has 400 fibers, so we can observe instead one star at a time, we can observe 400 stars at a time. So we started this program in 2018, S5, uh, with an international collaboration. Um, so far, we have observed over more than 70 nights on AAT. And uh, combining the, uh, the data, the spectroscope data from S5 and a very awesome data from Gaia, we were able to um, identify the member stars in each stream on the sky, knowing their 3D location, their 3D motion, and the chemistry. And using all of these data, we can understand like uh, the formation history of the Milky Way. So what we say is like the the, the, the Milky Way is formed like here articulate. And so we want to know like what it eats over the past uh, several billion years. So whether these streams are originated from, uh, originated from a disrupted satellite galaxy or a star cluster. And what are their orbits, their mass before they get disrupted, and also whether the connections between these streams and uh, the other satellite galaxies in our Milky Way. Because we have this very good data set, we can map individual stars in these stream and then knowing their location, also their motion. So this is the, the data Data set we presented and uh, uh, the individual star we identified uh, from the first um, 
uh, part of our survey that the data collected between 2018 and 2020. And again, this is an ongoing survey, so we hope there will be more results in the future. And now I would like to go to the same movie that I showed before, which I didn't talk about here uh, earlier. So here, as I mentioned, these are the 10 global clusters we throw in to uh, a simulation. And the let me stop, pause it for a moment. So the green particles here are the visible matter. So these are like star-like particles from the global cluster. And the red particles here are invisible dark matter. So we don't, we cannot see because these are dark matter. And the cool part of stream is we can use a, a a group of stream to kind of probe the invisible dark matter. And that's kind of the next thing uh, that we think the stream are powerful to do and what we're trying to work on. And uh, really people are already started doing this with one stream uh, at a time. But I think uh, the goal in the future is try to do this with multiple stream. Uh, a very good analog I would say is like, think of uh, a, a Christmas tree at a dark night. If you don't have the light there, you don't see the tree or the shape of the tree. But if you have these kind of twinkle lights surrounding the, 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 the Christmas uh, uh, tree, you will see the shape from those lights and you want to have more lights there so that you can map the, the, the shape of the tree well. And this is same idea with the with this stellar stream that we try to collect as many as we can and then try to, to uh, map the distribution of the invisible dark matter. Uh, so also I wanna say, uh, although we are starting this now, but uh, this is just uh, the starting point of the whole, I was in next decade in this topic to like use streams to map the, the Milky Way's uh, formation history and also the distribution of dark matter. There is a group, a big, um, I would say, um, group of spectroscopic survey either just started this year or will start in the next few years, including the Sloan 5 survey that you just heard in the previous session. And uh, some of these four meters uh, survey like Foremost, DASI, Weave, a lot of acronym, but these are all the survey has planned, will start soon and eight meter survey with Subaru on PFS. So I believe these are all the next generation survey that actually will start this and we are just starting it as a past final to learn about uh, what we can do with this stream. So that's all I'd like to present. And if you're interested in this, uh, I think the press release is just out and you can find more information on our website. And that's all, all what I would like to say. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you for those presentations. And let's go ahead and get started with the Q&A. If you haven't already, please enter your questions using the Q&A box um, and be sure to include your affiliation and who you'd like to direct your question toward. All right. Our first question comes from Govert Schilling for Shua. Um, Govert Schilling is a freelancer. If there was an outburst in the galactic center 110 years ago, might something be visible in archival images or observation reports? Thank you for uh, this question. Um, unfortunately, there is no uh, X-ray observation, actually no any other observation in, in any like wavelength of a Sagi star 100 years ago, so that's long ago, because Sagi star, the supermassive black hole itself was, if I'm not mistaken, it was discovered uh, in the 1960s by radio observations. So we have no way of directly knowing what it was doing uh, a, a couple, uh, 100 years ago or, or even uh, longer ago. However, we can try to find maybe other supporting um, evidence for its past active, uh, active stage. For example, if such a star indeed used to be a much brighter and energetic a couple hundred years ago, uh, besides uh, emitting um, higher level of X-ray emission, it might be also accelerating some like particles like electrons or protons into high energy. Then what do those uh, particles do? And can we, can we find any uh, observable um, events in the galaxy center caused by those energetic particles. That could be one way to, to double check um, on uh, past the uh, high um, activity for, for such a step. Great, thank you. Uh, Shua, another question for you from Rick Feinberg of the AAS. If I understand you correctly, you're saying the X-ray emissions from the various cold molecular clouds are analogous to light echoes from supernovae and novae reflecting off interstellar dust clouds. Yes? Is this an assumption, or is there some other evidence that supports this interpretation, or is there no other possible explanation of the clouds' X-ray emissions? 
Yeah, I'd be happy to answer uh, this question. Uh, firstly, I think a light echo is a, is a pretty accurate um, dis description of this uh, um, phenomena that X-ray emission is emitted from the central object, illuminating object, and then reached to, to some target molecular clouds and got reflected and to our line of sight. Uh, so um, besides maybe um, uh, interstellar dust reflecting uh, off emission from supernova, I'd say it's also very similar to um, to Taurus around the active uh, galactic nucleus, the, the active, uh, more active cousins to, to Sagittarius star, those very active supermassive black holes. And that's very uh, similar uh, phenomena. Uh, to the other question is that, is there um, other uh, evidence uh, or other possible interpretation of the molecular cloud X-ray emission? The answer is uh, yes. For example, a competing um, model or, or scenario is that X-ray emission of some of these molecular clouds in the central molecular uh, zone do not come from reflection of Sagittarius star um, outburst, but instead should, uh, could come from illumination or bombardment of ambient um, GeV uh, um, scale, um, like cosmic rays. Those are called like low energy. Uh, cosmic rays and those energetic like uh, protons or electrons could bombard into the molecular clouds and can also produce the observed uh, 6.4 keV iron line and the continuum emission. However, the time variability would be slightly different. It favors a more constant uh, variability trend. Uh, and this very significant increasing and decreasing trend we observed in uh, such B2 and the bridge cloud favors an X-ray reflection scenario. Great, thank you. Um, here's another question from Rick Feinberg of the AAS. This one is for Jewel. Um, do you see multiple discrete populations of stars with different ages, suggesting multiple discrete episodes of star formation in the galactic center? Or is there more of a continuum of ages suggesting some level of star formation going on over a long period? Yeah, that's a really great question. So according to uh, the modeling of the groups of stars, we do think the two groups of stars are coming from two discrete uh, episodes of the star formation in the galactic center. We say like two births of star formation events within a relatively shorter time scale. And for the dominant older group, uh, the sample, sample is large enough because the fraction is larger. So the age constraint is tighter, we say like four billion years plus minus two. Um, the minor younger age, uh, the younger group sample is smaller, the fraction is smaller. So the constraints on the age show a relatively larger range from one to four billion years, but tend to be younger than the dominant group. Uh, so now we think the 92% of the stars, the dominant group, 4 billion years old, are formed in situ, like at the galactic center. And then the rest of like 10% of stars, uh, metal pool stars, they might come from like formed outside the central region and failing to where they are, according to some extra dynamical um, structures of this population of low uh, metal abundances of stars. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, a question going back to Shuo, this one's from Bill Waller of the Galactic Inquirer. Have you ruled out excitation of these giant molecular clouds by the impact of stellar winds? Yeah, let's, uh, let, uh, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer this question. Like I briefly mentioned uh, in the talk, the reason why uh, it's most widely believed that the illuminating source is the central uh, supermassive black hole, because uh, firstly, the required luminosity is pretty high, up to 10 to 39 Earths per second in the X-ray uh, band alone. Also from such v 2 it stayed at its peak luminosity for uh, at least 10 years, according to uh, earlier X-ray observation. Therefore, the outburst events could last as long as 10 years. And the, the only maybe object, the extreme, uh, that extreme um, could be the supermassive black hole, the Sagittarius star. Um, so stellar winds might not um, uh, be like uh, sustain such a high energetic events for, for that long time. On the other hand, some, some other 
um, some colleagues might uh, indeed argue that uh, have you considered other uh, illuminating source, for example, like the um, magnetar discovered uh, a couple of years ago, and maybe there are other um, energetic um, sources like the, the magnetar that can give a very large outburst. And again, those uh, can maybe explain a, a illumination, illumination uh, event um, that happens at a, within a shorter time, like maybe uh, up to one year or so. But in order to produce an illumination event up to 10 years or even longer, still, we believe that the supermassive black hole is the most likely source. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question here for Allison from Gubbert Schilling Freelance. I understand that Sen A's satellite galaxies are mainly found in more or less one single plane, the so-called plane of satellites problem. Is the same true for your globular clusters? Uh, we have not found that yet, but that will be interesting to see for the globular clusters that are a little bit further out. Uh, so that's yeah, definitely something we're gonna be looking into. Great, we will all look forward to that. Yep. Um, another question for you, Allison, from Rick Feinberg of the AAS. In addition to identifying globular clusters in and around Sen A, will you be able to tell if different ones might have come from different galaxies involved in past mergers, for example, by compositions, motions, or some other characteristics? Yeah, so what's really cool about the combination of having the Pisces data set that I showed, as well as the globular cluster population, is that we can map globular clusters onto specific stellar overdensities. So we can tell not only if a line of globular clusters have the same radial velocity dispersion, but if they also lie on top of one of these stellar overdensities, then we can be a lot more sure that that's an incoming uh, like dwarf galaxy, for example. Um, and additionally, some of our spectroscopy was taken in more high resolution modes. Uh, and so for some of the brighter galax uh, globular clusters, uh, like a magnitude uh, of about 19 or brighter, uh, we should be able to estimate metallicities as well as some internal velocity dispersions. So for some of them, we'll definitely be able to get really great information. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, I have a question here for Ting from Gubbert Schilling Freelance. What about individual streams being disturbed by smaller concentrations, subhalos of dark matter? Is there any evidence of that in your data? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's another topic I didn't um, uh, mention too much, but uh, the idea is the uh, dark matter subhero in the Milky Way can also perturb these streams, especially the cold streams or the globular cluster stream. So uh, we actually published a paper just last year for one of the particular stream in this 12 stream sample that uh, we see these kind of, we call spur or kink or gap kind of feature. We think that we believe that is coming from a perturbation with uh, some dark matter subhalo. And uh, for the other global cost stream, we are also searching for these kind of signatures. So definitely is something we are looking into details. Um, this paper is more like a big uh, group. Some of the stream we have already started in detail, like individually, and some are still working on that. But yeah, we see some of these signature. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Ting, another question for you from Christopher Kokonos of Astronomy Magazine. Can you redefine stellar streams and briefly discuss the history of our knowing about them? Uh, I'm not sure about uh, what, what the meaning for uh, redefine. So what I say stellar stream is talking about these companions of a host galaxy like our Milky Way and get tidally disrupted and form this kind of group of stars moving together on the sky, like a linear structure. Uh, that's what I will say the definition. Um, I wanna just show a quick slide here uh, if to answer about the history of our knowing of the stream. So this is like the cumulative number of stellar streams in our Milky Way as a function when it was discovered. I hope that's a question that uh, um, uh, the, 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 the answer for the question. So the first one we know is in about early 1990. So I'm not sure if you guys can see clearly. So the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, we see the tidal tails around it. So that's a Sagittarius stream. And then this is a dwarf galaxy that got dis tidally disrupted. And then when um, in early 2000, the first globular cluster stream, it's a tidal disrupted global cluster. So we see this one, it's called Palma 5 global cluster. So it's Palma 5 stream. And then you can see there is the burst of discovery thanks to a lot of imaging survey like Sloan, you might heard, and the dark energy survey, and also like the uh, Gaia, all of these. So there's 
I mean, at the end of 2018, depending on if you trust all these or not, there's like a reported about 60 or more stream has discovered, but most of these are just discovered by the imaging survey and they're not really confirmed. And that kind of motivated me to start this S5 collaboration to follow them up, to confirm and to do more characterization. And that's what I wanted to kind of answer the history about the, the stream. Great, thank you. Okay, we have about five minutes left and as many questions. So let's try to get to all of them. Um, Ting, one more question for you from Rick Feinberg at the AAS. I think I heard you say you hope to be able to distinguish streams from satellite galaxies from, oh, sorry, distinguish streams from satellite galaxies from streams from star clusters. How would you do that? In other words, what are the observations you'd use to distinguish between those two populations? Yeah, that's a very good question. And if I said uh, we hope to, I meant to say we did actually in this paper. And the, this is one of the important um, conclusion from our work. So among these 12 stream, actually, we find half of them are from origin from global cluster and half of them origin from satellite galaxy. And we observe their velocity distribu distribution and their velocity or say the metal uh, distribution to based on the distribution, we can say if it's from a global cluster or dwarf galaxy. And the either way to think of this is a, a dwarf galaxy has dark matter there and it's much heavier. It usually have a high, high, larger mass, so it has a larger velocity dispersion. And also it might have multiple uh, star formation history. That's why you will see a spread in the velocity. And uh, for global cost stream, we don't see don't see that. So we observe these uh, different kinematic and chemical features to distinguish them. And that's one of the important work or conclusion from our work. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Allison from Larry Krumenacher at the Galactic Times newsletter. You mentioned Sun A has about 1,500 estimated globulars. How does that number compare to the Milky Way and Andromeda? Uh, so the Milky Way has about 150 globular clusters that have been discovered so far, um, with the caveat that the galactic plane does get in the way. So there very well could be many more that we just haven't found yet. Uh, and the Andromeda galaxy has uh, between four and 500 globular clusters that have been found so far. Uh, so we do predict that uh, Centaurus A does have a lot more globular clusters than the Milky Way and Andromeda, but that could be because they're two different types of galaxies that have had very different formation histories. Uh, Sen A has had a lot more collisions with smaller galaxies because it's in a more dense environment. So it could have, you know, gobbled up more from its neighbors. Thank you. Um, another question from Larry Krumenacher at the Galactic Times newsletter. This one is for Ting. Can you explain where you get the 12 part in the title of your presentation? Yeah, maybe I didn't make it clear, but uh, so the point of this paper is we started the 12 streams uh, in a homogeneous way. So it's observed by the same instrument and they're using the same way of the measurement for 12 stellar streams in our Milky Way. And that's where the 12 coming from. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question here for Jewel from Ethan Siegel of Starts With a Bang. When you fold in non-solar metallicities, it's easy to see how the average age has changed. But what accounts for the bimodal distribution in the probability density of the age of the ancient burst? It looks like one at maybe 3.x billion years is peaked at a much lower age to the solar metallicity assumption, but the other one appears to be peaked right around where the fixed solar metallicity would indicate at about 7 billion years. Um, cool, yeah. So the bimodal uh, distribution could be from a lot of different effects. Um, in the modeling, we need to account for the degeneracies between the properties of the cluster, like, like this population, like extinction of this region and initial mass function of the, of the birds to describe how the mass of the stars distribute. And such distribution in the probability density function of the age also comes from the fittings themselves. We did run a lot of different fittings and account for such effects and uncertainties. Uh, so here they reported uh, like plus minus two billion years uncertainties. Uh, those did uh, include cover the one sigma arrows on the fittings and to cover such, uh, it looks like bimodal distribution, yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, I have a question from Christopher Kokonos at Astronomy Magazine for Ting. 
Do you and your colleagues have an idea about how long it will take to model the 60 or 70 stellar streams that you mentioned? Yeah, so first of all, we needed to have data to be able to model them. So I would say, we, as I showed early in the plot, only probably a third of the stream that I showed has actually full 60 data when I say this means location and motion, right? So we first need to collect more data and hope that the next generation, the spectroscopic survey will give us uh, like a a good, good data set to have all of this in hand for modeling. And we are actually starting to doing the modeling with the data we have in hand. For example, um, one of the um, postdoc in S5 also published a paper uh, recently using five out of these uh, 12 streams that are present today and use them to constrain the mass of the larger Magellan cloud. So we did that, but we're only doing that one at a time. And we compare like uh, what's the difference between one stream versus another. And I think the next goal for us is to use all the stream we have observed in S5 with full 60, mo uh, 60 phase space information to constrain the mass distribution, matter distribution of Milky Way plus the larger moon cloud together. And that will take a lot of computer time. So we think we need to run some kind of like week long kind of simulations to compare with our data, but that's something we wanna do in next. Great, thank you. That's a perfect timing. And back to you, Haley. All right, thanks, Carrie. Uh, I just wanted to thank all the speakers for their wonderful presentations. Thank you to the audience for all of your great questions. Uh, thank you to the PIOs who helped with the press releases and the briefing prep. Thank you USRA for sponsoring this press conference. And our next press conference will be tomorrow, Wednesday, January 12th at 10.15 a.m. Mountain Time called Evolving Stars and Their Activity. And we hope to see you there. <laughs>